early Sunday morning, July 5, 1970. In Montreal, Quebec, Captain Peter Hamilton glances upwards as he heads to the airport. With little wind and no clouds, it is a perfect day for flying, a passion of his that dates back 30 years to his first days in the Air Force. Peter was always determined to go on being a pilot because he loved it so much. It was his favorite thing to do. He was actually very poetic about it, the solitude up there in the clouds. He was crazy about flying. With experience and leadership skills, Peter is now one of Air Canada's most reliable and respected pilots. He was a very, very outgoing personality. He was the kind of person that you, he would walk into a room and everybody knew that he was there. Just a very warm and, and outgoing and interested man. And people responded very, very strongly to him. At the airport, Captain Hamilton meets with his cockpit crew for the day. Donald Rowland is the first officer, or FO, and second officer is H. Gordon Hill. Their assignment is Flight 621, one of Air Canada's most popular routes. The flight plan involves a short 50-minute route from Montreal to Toronto, followed by a long leg south to Los Angeles. Flight 621 has been nicknamed the Champagne Flight, filled as it often is with holiday travelers and festive mood. Adding to the sense of luxury is the brand new Super DC-8 aircraft that services the route. It is one of the largest passenger planes available and one of the first to earn the title Jumbo Jet. Airlines wanted more uh, seating, seating arrangements. Uh, they wanted to be able to transport more people. This, this is a big airplane. They were certainly uh, state-of-the-art uh, airplanes, uh, advertised as such. As the crew enters the cockpit, they would likely agree that the new DC-8 is not only bigger and faster, but also safer than earlier models. There is, however, one issue that still causes debate, even concern, among pilots. It involves the ground spoilers on the wings. When a plane touches down on the runway, the ground spoilers are deployed. Ground spoilers disrupt the flow of air over the wings, effectively pushing the plane downward and keeping it on the runway. They can be deployed manually by pulling a lever once the plane has landed, or automatically by using an arming switch. Once armed, the spoilers deploy on their own as soon as the landing gear touches the ground. This crew had in the past worked out a system whereby when the captain was flying, the first officer would pull the spoilers manually on the ground once they landed. When the FO was flying, the captain would arm them in the flare. In other words, one just above the runway. On this particular morning, there seems to be an ongoing debate about changing this routine. This is the first fateful move towards deadly consequences. 7 a.m. As passengers wait to board Flight 621, stewardess Hildegund Weiserek begins her workday. She is known to her friends as Gundi and has recently married a local ticket agent from Montreal. She worked for Air Canada and he worked for uh, Canadian Pacific Airlines. He'd seen her off that day and uh, he was working at the same time that she was working and uh, you know, he saw her uh, you know, go towards the plane. Once aboard, Gundy greets passengers. Claude Holliday is a purchaser for Bell Canada. Although Claude is heading to California on business, his spirits are just as high as those heading south for pleasure. Remember him telling me how he enjoyed taking those flights, you know, like to California and who he was gonna meet when he was going down there. He basically was the kind of person that if you met him, you wouldn't forget him. Just one of those type of guys whistled his way to work every day and whistled his way home. And he loved his job. Also boarding the plane are Linda and Luella Earl, 21-year-old twins, both studying to be nurses. My sisters uh, were young, very busy. They were always together. They had uh, similar interests. They were happy, they were eager to go on vacation. 
We had a going away party for them the evening before. We had about 100 people just dancing and people laughing and joking. It was a, it was a nice goodbye party. 7.17 a.m. Along with a total of nine crew members, 100 passengers are now on board Flight 621. You had a, a beautiful sunny day and blue sky. You had a brand new airplane, hadn't really even been broken in yet. You know, you had people uh, going on vacation. The flight takes off as scheduled and heads southwest, briefly reaching a cruising altitude of 30,000 feet before beginning a gradual descent towards its first and only stopover in Toronto. 7.59 a.m. Flight 621 is granted permission to drop to 3,000 feet and begin an approach towards Toronto's runway 32. In preparation for landing in Toronto, Gundy Weiserek goes through her cross-check routine. She insists that all chairs are in their upright position and that all passengers are firmly buckled with their seatbelts. The only thing that I would say about my dad is that he did not like to wear seatbelts, even though you're supposed to wear them. He would just put it across his lap like he had it on, but he wouldn't have it on, because he had this phobia about being, I think, about being buckled in. 8.02 a.m., four minutes to touchdown. During a final before landing check, the crew talks once more about the ground spoilers. The captain decides that the first officer will arm the ground spoilers so they deploy automatically when the plane touches the ground. The first officer agrees, even though he is in the habit of pulling the manual lever when the plane is safely on the ground. So when they were on final at approximately 60, 80 feet above the runway, something like that, the captain gave the first officer the okay to do it. But the first officer, referring to what he was accustomed to doing, pulled him. He extended it instead of just turning. With the ground spoilers deployed in the air, Flight 621 takes a dangerous plunge towards the tarmac. The captain realizes his first officer's mistake and tries to abort the landing. Peter Hamilton uh, floored the engines and brought the nose up as high as possible. He did everything he could have and did it quickly. It isn't enough. Flight 621 strikes the runway briefly, but hard. And engine number four breaks off from the wing, rupturing a fuel tank. For passengers, especially those not strapped in, it is a terrifying jolt. I uh, would feel like you crashed. It would make a terrible noise. Within seconds, a glance outside tells them they are airborne once again. Captain Hamilton does a quick damage assessment. According to the instrument panel, engine number four is powerless, but the crew has no idea that it has been torn right off. They didn't think that they had a real serious problem. They just thought, now they had three engines and we'll come back and land. The tank had a four foot hole in it, which didn't put a lot of fuel out of it. So it started just bleeding fuel like crazy. And it's passing by electrical wires and hot points number of, of ignition sources that were possible. As they circle for another landing, the crew and passengers of Flight 621 think they have just survived a close call. The worst, however, is yet to come. They were completely oblivious to, to the real problem, and then things uh, slowly started unraveling uh, thereafter. July 5th. 1970. Near Toronto, the captain of a jumbo jet carrying 109 people circles to attempt a second landing, unaware that he is losing fuel through a large hole in his wing. In an instant, a sparking wire changes everything. He caught fire and you know, worked his way up to the wing. Passengers panic as flames appear outside. Seconds later, the explosion obliterates the tip of the wing. They were dealing with one crisis after another and then not really having any, any time to really change their fate. 
Down on the ground, Gordon and Carol Parr are startled awake by the sound of the plane overhead. We were woke up with this horrible sound. So we looked out the window and we saw the shadow going over our house. And we could see the wing on fire. There was a second explosion which blew almost all the right wing off. And then we saw a big piece of the wing fall off and go in the field by our house. And then we watched a plane. It seemed to be wavering. For passengers like the Earl twins and Claude Holliday, hopes of a safe landing fade as the plane rockets towards the ground. You have this kind of survival instinct that says, we're going to make it. And usually it's not too far before the end before somebody finally says, well, we're probably not. They probably knew for the last five seconds, maybe 10. I think they were hanging on together. and I guess they said their last prayers. They came together, they left together. I don't know what would have gone through my dad's mind. I guess just thinking about the kids, thinking about his life, and thinking about my mom. And we had a clear view till it hit the ground. And then we saw a plume of smoke, but there wasn't much flame, just the smoke. And then it was all over. And there was just great silence. We just were in shock. And I was feeling, how many people were in that plane? Is there anybody survived? What should we do? You just don't know what to do. It's so overwhelming. Hoping to help, Gordon jumps in the car and drives towards the rising smoke. He is one of the first on the scene. He looked around, and all it was was a blackened heap of metal burning. Like a big plane like that was just in pieces. He just heard the eerie silence and the crackling of the, the fire. Ambulance attendant Murray Loveless and his partner arrive minutes later, around the same time as the airport's emergency truck. The crash truck put out the main portion of fire. Uh, then one of the guys from the crash truck, he and I took a couple of extinguishers and put out some spot fires. And it was obvious from the destruction that there wouldn't be any survivors. At their cottage, the family of Claude Holliday learns the fate of Flight 621 on the news. We had heard on the radio that uh, this flight had crashed in Toronto. My sister and I both knew that that was my dad's flight. We had to go through that process with my mother, which was the shock of telling her, you know, that my dad was on that, who we felt was on the plane. She just started screaming and going, you know, no, your father was too smart to get on that plane. She really had a tough time dealing with it because her and my father were so close together at the time. News radio. Fighting broke out overnight between rival factions along In Montreal, Morris Earl is cleaning up after his two twin sisters going away party when a similar news report stops him in his tracks. It was a very scared time, very helpless time. I felt helpless. I couldn't. You know, I couldn't do. I didn't have any choices. I couldn't help. I couldn't do nothing. I could only stay strong and keep my mother uh, as you know calm as possible. But it was it was a, a crusher. Captain Hamilton's brother has also heard news of the crash, but few details about who was on board. A phone call from the airline confirms his worst fears. As soon as I heard him say, you know, that he was from Air Canada, I knew what it was. I tried one last sort of hope, thinking there maybe had been some survivors. And I asked him, were there any survivors? And he said, no. All 109 people on board Flight 621 have perished, making it one of Canada's worst aviation disasters to date. Among the few recognizable items recovered at the scene are a child's doll and a stewardess's uniform. The latter is a particularly painful image for the young ticket agent who recently married stewardess 
Hildegund Weiserek. There was somebody young and so full of life. She seemed to have, you know, everything uh, going for her, and, uh, and then everything was just uh, abruptly ended. What caused the crash and what might have been done to prevent it become key questions in a public inquiry. Human error is clearly at fault, but blame is also cast across the aviation industry. Poor training and incomplete information regarding the ground spoilers seem to have led to dangerous practices in cockpits across North America. In addition, experts are baffled that some kind of safety device doesn't exist to prevent the accidental deployment of ground spoilers while the plane is still airborne. Why would you build a system like that where it could be done when you know that it shouldn't be? That there are disastrous, possible disastrous results, then why didn't you put a mechanical lock that said you can't pull them? Before long, a metal restraining pin stands guard behind the ground spoiler lever in all remaining DC-8s. I think the most positive thing that, that came out of it, aside from putting in a, something so you couldn't do it again, was that the whole system got shaken up. Transport Canada hired air care inspectors who started a much more stringent oversight of the large carrier. Unfortunately, these changes come too late for the passengers and crew of Flight 621. Today, more than three decades after the accident, painful remnants still surface in the very field where the Champagne flight came to an abrupt end. It is a metaphor, perhaps, for the persistence of memory. When disaster strikes, grief is never easily buried. The impact on the families was, uh, was severe. The trauma has continued on through the years. Uh, they were devastated then, and they're devastated now. I would say I probably lost my one of my best friends, which was my father. It's a terrible hole in your social fabric, and it doesn't it doesn't get less. I mean, naturally, the the tragic aspects of it become less painful over the years, but you know, it's something that you don't get over. The sad memories of a tragedy also loom for those affected by the fire at Montreal's Bluebird Cafe. She was a fine young woman, and her family misses her a lot. She was robbed of life, and it's not fair. I had learned before that when my other daughter was killed that life is short, and and never be afraid to say, I love you, watch out, take care. I can look up in the sky sometimes and I see Kathy's face. I say, hi, little angel, or something silly. <laughs> She's looking after me now. So then that gives you the strength to go on. <laughs>